Hi, my name is Elijah, and I have the privilege to serve as the creative pastor here at City Life Church. We just wanted to quickly thank you. Thank you for tuning in wherever you may be watching from. Hey, if you haven't already, please go ahead and click the like and subscribe button. We believe that God has an amazing word for you today. So let's jump into today's message. We're going to continue our, our series, The Bible Story, and I don't have one with me today, and I don't have my flannel boards with me. But, you know, we celebrated at one time the gift of the Bible. I remember growing up, and I told you I'd go in doctor's offices or other places, and there'd be these blue books called the Bible story. And they'd have stories of the Bible. And we've been preaching on the stories of the Bible for the last month. We started out with Jonah and the whale. I had a guy say, Pastor, I didn't even know that was in the Bible. We talked about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, how they walked through the fiery furnace of life and how they met Jesus there because they decided not to bow to culture of the day. And when you choose not to bow to culture, but you choose to stand on the word of God and for God, he always meets you in the midst of the battle. We talked about Zacchaeus, how Jesus found Zacchaeus in a tree, and then he went home with him. Pastor Casey last week did an amazing job preaching on Sarah. And today we're going to talk about Nehemiah. Now we're not building a building. Usually when a pastor preaches on Nehemiah, they're going to launch into a building campaign. We're not building anything today. But there's some great principles in the story of Nehemiah. The background of Nehemiah is this. He was living in a palace, serving a king. He had a plush surrounding. But God would call him to go back to the city of God, the city of Jerusalem, and rebuild a wall. Now, there are actually three men that were very instrumental in this process. First was Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel or Zerubbabel. It's easy to remember Zerubbabel because he had to clear out all the rubble. So Zerubbabel was sent back to rebuild the wall after almost 80 years of captivity where they were in exile. And they got back to the city. The gates had been burned. The wall was torn down. But his assignment was to rebuild the house of God. The first thing they did was to rebuild the temple. And it took almost 15 years. Remember, they got discouraged. We've talked about this before. And God showed up in Zechariah chapter 4 and declared, It's not by might and it's not by power, but it is by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. And he said, What I've started, I will finish. That's a good word for somebody today. What God started in your life, he will finish. What God started in your journey, he will finish. He's not a man that he would lie, but I want you to know this. It's not by your might, not by your power, but by his spirit. So Zerubbabel was very... And then we find that there was Ezra. Ezra would be build the people of God. Zerubbabel would rebuild the house of God. Zer Ezra would build up the people of God. And he would fortify their faith once again. But we find that... Nehemiah would be commissioned to rebuild the great wall of protection because you can have a place of worship. You can know who you are in God, but if you are not fortified, there is an adversary out there. There is a feat that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And if you ever want to make it to the abundant life, you've got to understand that you have to be under the fortification and the protection of the kingdom. And here we're going to pick up in Nehemiah chapter 1. Where Nehemiah is in the palace, he has the easy life. I mean, he's in the palace with the king, not just in the palace, he's in the inner sanctum of the king. He's right there in a special place, the holy place of the king. And here's what it says. These are the memoirs of Nehemiah, the son of he Hecali. In late autumn, in the month of Chelsea, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was at the fortress of Susa, Hannah, and one of my brothers came to visit me with some other men who had just arrived from Judah. I asked them about the Jews who had returned there from captivity and about how things were going in Jerusalem. They said to me, things are not going well. For those who have returned in the province of Judah, they are in great trouble, discouraged, and disgraced. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed with fire. But when I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned and fasted and prayed to the God of heaven. We find that Nehemiah was just in the palace serving. And one day some of his family came and some of the members of a royal entourage as they would visit the palace and give tribute to the king. And he asked, he said, how's it going back home? And he said, it's trouble. The wall's been torn down. There's no protection. 
Everything that could be pillaged has been pillaged. There was this roaming group of what they called Edomites. And Edomites would steal and pillage everything. He said, because there's no protection, they're stealing everything. He said, people are discouraged. The city has become disgraced. And immediately it broke the heart of Nehemiah. And Nehemiah became burdened. Now, when I was growing up in the church, we heard a lot about being burdened having a burden. Now, if you've not been in church very long, you may not know that word, but it, it simply means that God stirs your heart and gives you a heavy heart of compassion for something. And sometimes you're looking for a ministry and God places the ministry right there before you. I remember hearing a story about Mother Teresa, a young reporter, asked her, he said, do you really feel called to feed all these hungry children and live in the slums? And she made this statement, the needs, the call. Sometimes the call is not a stage or a platform. Sometimes the, need, the, the call is not a microphone in your hand, but it's just a broken place God puts before you and a hurting people that God puts before you. And he said, there's the call, it's the need. In a moment in the palace, Nehemiah became burdened. And the Bible said he began to pray, he begins to cry out to God. And one day in Nehemiah chapter 2, while serving the king, this is what happens. Early the following spring in the month of Nisan, during the twelfth year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was serving the king his wine. I had never appeared before him with sadness. So the king asked me, he said, why are you looking so sad, Nehemiah? You don't look sick to me. You must be deeply troubled. Then I was terrified, but I replied, long live the king. How can I not be sad? For the city where my ancestors are buried is in ruins. And the gates have been destroyed by fire. The king asked, well, how can I help you? With a prayer to God of heaven, I replied, if it please the king, and if you are pleased with me, and I have found favor in your sight, send me to Judah to rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried. Here's what happens. He's serving the king. And what you have to understand, you never came into the king's presence with a sad or distressed countenance. Because everything in the king's presence had to be about the king. You could not make it about you. So the king had never seen him in this state before. And the king asked, he said, Nehemiah, what's going on? You don't look sick, but surely you're distressed. And he began to pray. So it comes to him, he says, long live the king. He realized what would happen if he was not serving the king with joy. And the king said, Tell me, Nehemiah, what's going on? And he said, how can I be joyful when the place I'm from, where my ancestors are buried, is in distress? Matter of fact, it's been disgraced. The wall's been torn down. The gates have been burned with fire, and the people are just remnants. And then the king said this, how can I help? I think sometimes we come into the presence of the king overwhelmed, but we never petition him. We come in sad, but we never petition him. We come in overwhelmed, but we never petition him. We come in with this heavy heart and this solemn spirit, but we never petition him. I want You know, we serve a God that is not only able, but he is willing. And the Bible said, the king asked, what can I do for you? What can I do to help Nehemiah? The Bible says we have not because we... Oh, we've got some church people in the room today. We have not because we asked not. I think sometimes the king is waiting and just saying, what do you need? I'm here. Just I'm a very present help in a time of trouble. If you will call upon my name, I'm always there to be found. The king said, what can I do for you? And then the Bible said, in a moment of transition, in a place of prayer and solitude, we find he said, I need favor. He said, I need favor. I'm telling you, I pray every morning that God's favor would rest on me, my family, and this house. Matter of fact, this is a household of favor. You're sitting in a building we should not be sitting in. Other people wanted this building. But one moment of God's favor changes everything. This is a ministry of favor. And I pray that the favor that is on this house rests on your house. I pray that you are a household of favor. You are people of favor. Because one moment in God's favor changes everything. He began to pray for favor for the king. He found it. He said, if you will show favor to me. Then he said, I need access. 
He said, I need letters. I need letters to the governors. I need letters to the treasury and to the fortress. And I need letters to those that rule and reign so that I can have access. I'm praying as God gives you favor, he gives you access to the right places. He gives you access to the right people. He positions you at the right moment. Because if you ever find yourself at the right place, at the right time, surrounded by the right people, and you know that you're serving the right God, anything is possible. And he said, I need access. I need access. I believe God's about to open some doors for some people. He said, not only do I need access, but I need authority. Father, I need authority. What he needed was this. When he got back to the city of Jerusalem, he needed them to see him not as a cupbearer, not as a man that lived in a palace, but a general contractor. Somebody that had the plan for the day. Somebody that walked in the authority of the king. And I'm praying this, that when people see you and when the world sees you, they don't see the label of your yesterday, but they see the authority of a king. They see the authority of the word of God. Matter of fact, Jesus said this. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, and I give it to you. It's time that the people of God take hold of the authority of a kingdom and the keys of a kingdom and rise up as people of the kingdom. He prayed for authority. I need them to see me as a man with the plan. I need them to know that I'm here on assignment of the king. Then he began to pray for wisdom. Lord, I need wisdom in this journey. I need to know how to maneuver. I've never done this before. Sometimes it's okay not to know because you serve the one that does know. He holds all truth, the Bible said. He's the revealer of truth. And it's okay not to know. Sometimes we try to fake it. I'm telling you, the plan is not fake it till you make it. The plan is asking the one that holds all truth to give you wisdom and understanding. He said, if you will ask, I will give it to you liberally. I will give it to you in abundance. Matter of fact, I'm an alpha God and an omega God, a beginning God and an end God. I lack for nothing. And if you ever get the revelation that he's timeless and spaceless, it changes the way you live your Christian journey. You say, well, pastor, what does that even mean? That means he's not only in your crazy now, he might be in your messed up yesterday. Yesterday, but he's also in your prophetic future. But here's the revelation all at the same time. He's not bound by a day, not bound by a night, not down, bound by a morning, not bound by a rising. Here's what you have to understand God is God. And he is in your yesterday while he's in your present, but he's also in your tomorrow. And when you trust him and serve him and begin to allow him to give you wisdom, he begins to deposit it in your journey. But then Nehemiah began to pray for victory. He said, Lord, let me finish what you start. Father, I don't want to just get the wall half built, three quarters built, but I want to finish and I want to have victory. And the word was this, that God would be with him and God would fight for him. They leave the palace and the wall begins to build. Brick upon brick. Mortar being mixed. The wall is coming up. And I'm telling you, things are going well. This cupbearer is now a general contractor. There were times we were building this. I felt like I I wanted to be the general contractor, but Frank was our general contractor. I'd come down here and get everything messed up. I'd say, Frank, can we move that wall over? And he said, but if we do, Pastor, it's going to cost this, this, and this. I said, nah, just leave the wall there. (laughs) But there were times I said, go ahead and move the wall. You know, you just walk around and see it and don't always. But he now is not a cupbearer. He's a general contractor. He's building the wall. And they're building this fortress for the people of God and this security for the people of God. And we pick up in Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 6. And at last the wall was completed to half its point. It was around the entire city for the people had worked with enthusiasm. But when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Amorites and the Ashadites heard that the work was going ahead and that the gaps in the wall of Jerusalem were being repaired, they were furious They all made plans to come and fight against Jerusalem and to throw us into confusion. But we prayed, I love this, but we prayed to our God and guarded the city day and night to protect ourselves. Here's what it says. They prayed to God and then they protected the city. Here's what I believe. Sometimes we're waiting on God to do everything. He said, if you train your children the right way, I, Father God, will keep them. If you bring your tithe and offerings to the storehouse, I will open the windows of heaven. If you pray the prayer of uh, faith for the sick, 
I will release the healing. There are some things that God says, this is a partnership. The Bible said they begin to pray because the enemy wanted to come in and confuse the work of the Lord. But they were focused, the Bible said. The wall was already half up. And the Bible said when they heard that the breaches were being repaired. Here's what you have to see. The breaches, not just the wall coming up, but the breaches. The breaches were where the enemy got in. The breaches were those places, those holes in the wall where the enemy got in. And I'm telling you, if you do not secure the breaches in the wall of faith in your life, the enemy gets in those places. But they begin to secure all the breaches. And there was no place for the enemy to get in and pillage the people of God. And they got furious. And they began to war against the people of God. And they tried to confuse the people of God. They began to come against them physically. They began to come against them emotionally. They began to come against them spiritually. And Nehemiah began to pray because the work was stalling. And Nehemiah said, God, I need wisdom. And God says, do this. He said, I want you to put a sword on every one of the workers. I want the enemy to know when I, they sh when the enemy shows up, I want them to look at that brick uh, layer or that mortar mixer or that one carrying timber and say, you know what, they're not just a brick layer, but they must be a warrior as well. And I'll tell you, you have a sword. And when the enemy comes along and he tries to get through the breach of your life and he sees you equipped with the word of God and he knows that you are equipped with the sword of the word of God, it makes him nervous because the only thing that will defeat the adversary of your life, it's not your talent. It's not your money. It's not your means. But it is the word of the living God. The Bible said it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And he said, put a sword on every worker. But don't just stop there. Come help me, Pastor Jason. The Bible said he put a sword on every worker. Because when the enemy comes in, I want to know that we're ready for battle. But the Bible said when the bricklayer was making a brick, the enemy would come in and kill the bricklayer. And then he'd come in and kill the mortar mixer. It, those that were carrying timberland from the lowland, he would kill them. And the Bible said finally, it, it, it hit Nehemiah. He said, I'll tell you what I need you to do. He said, when the bricklayer is laying brick, I want you to take the mortar mixer and have him draw his sword out. And I want him to stand back to back with that other worker. And those that carry timber, when they're not carrying timber, have them draw their swords out. If they're not in their assigned position, they can be people of warfare. And I want them to stand back to back with that one that is working on their assignment. And I want them to put the enemy on notice. If you're going to get to him, you've got to come through me. If you're going to get to him, you've got to come through me. I think it's time that believers, instead of killing each other on Facebook, instead of trying to destroy everybody's character, instead of fighting with each other over nonsense we draw our sword out we stand back to back and say I want you to put the enemy on notice if you're going to get to my kids you've got to come through me if you're going to get to my grandchildren you've got to come through me if you're going to get to my family you've got to come through me we're building a wall we're securing God's purpose we're fortifying God's plan we're going to draw our sword out we are the family of God we're not going to kill each other. We're going to cover one another. We're going to bless one another. We're going to stand for righteousness. We're going to stand in the face of culture. We're going to stand in the face of the lie of the adversary. And the Bible said the wall was going up. The wall was getting built. And in verse chapter 6, verse 1, it said this. Finally, the wall was complete, and when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab and the rest of the enemies found out that I had finished rebuilding the wall, that there were no gaps, any place for the enemy to get in. We hadn't hung the doors yet or the gates. So Sanballat and Geshem sent a message asking me to meet them at the village in the plain of Ono. But I realized they were plotting to harm me. I realized they were plotting to harm me, so I replied by sending this message to them. I am engaged in a great work. I'm too busy to come down. Why should I stop working to come and meet with you? Sometimes you have to watch what you give your attention to. They had already completed the wall. Chris, if I can go ahead to get you to come to the keys. They had already completed the wall. The enemy comes in. He stopped now defeating the people of God. He's already stopped coming in and killing them one by one. But now he's trying to get in their head and in their mind. And he calls out and he says, why don't you come down and meet us in the plain of Ono? There are some places that are Ono. Oh <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, Oh no. And if you ever get into the place of oh no, the enemy will defeat you. 
But if you ever have discernment that that's an oh no place and I'm not going there, I'm going to stay on the wall because my assignment is too important. My family is too important. What God has placed me in is too important. Oh no, I'm staying on the wall. Oh no, my family is now secure. Oh no, I'm too busy doing a good work. I've got a good work. I've got a good report. God's doing a good thing to mess it up. And I made up my mind. For me and my house, we're going to serve serve the Lord. We're moving into God's goodness. We're moving into a place of purpose. We're going to walk this thing out by faith. I love what the Bible said. Here's what happens in the book of Nehemiah in chapter 4. The Bible said Nehemiah gathered families together and he put them in strategic places on the wall. And he said, I'm going to give you bows. I'm going to give you arrows. I'm going to give you swords and I'm going to give you spears. And he said, you're going to stand as a watchman on the wall. And if the enemy comes in, I want you to make a shout and make a sound. I love that City Life Church is not the only church, but we are watchmen on the wall. And we've been placed at the right place in Tampa, Florida. And there are churches in Atlanta, Georgia, and in Dallas, Texas, and in Chicago. I just got back from Brazil, and there's a mighty move of God in Brazil happening right now. We're sending people to Guatemala tomorrow, but we are watchmen on the wall. But I love when it said he put them in family units. There's something about the community of family that brings protection. There's something about the community of family that causes us to rise up and guard one another. There's something about the community of believers. So it's more than just eating kettle corn. It's building community. Because you're my family. And if I have to, I'll pull out a rock and fight a giant. If I have to, I can do more than just worship. I've got a sword on my side. See, David had it all figured out. David said, we can sing. This is the day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad. As a matter of fact, let everything that hath breath praise the name of the Lord. But if I have to, I can pull out my sword and fight a bear, fight a lion. I'll pull out a rock and fight a giant. We can worship or we can do battle, but I'm going to do whatever I need to advance the kingdom of God. I'm too busy doing a good work. And some of you are being distracted by too many things. And God says, stay on the wall. Some of you are being distracted by things that are pulling you from your purpose. And God says, stay on the wall. Some of you are being sidetracked from the assignment on your life. And God says, stay on the wall. Quit responding to the critics. Let the haters. I'll tell you what, Silent, Sanballat, and Tobias, when they heard we had finished the wall, we didn't have to argue with them. The proof is what God had done. The proof is, look what the Lord had done. Look what God has done in my life. When we walked in, it was a rubble, but God's built the wall. When we walked in, it was disaster, but God's built the wall. When you looked at me in the beginning, I didn't look like much but I'm telling you he not only picked me up he cleaned me up he turned me around he established me look what the Lord had done I'm not going to argue with you I'm too busy doing a good work you're not going to pull me to the place of Ono but I'm going to stir uh, stand firm in my foundation and know who I am and I found out this that as the wall went up faith began to rise as the wall went up miracles began to increase as the wall went up provision began to come in I'm telling you God's building a wall for you he's raising up standards for you he's repairing the breach let's stand this morning was there anybody here when we brought the live lion in for uh, Easter we haven't done it since because PETA got mad at me and they put me on their website. They did. We got, matter of fact, our email system crashed one day and all we did was bring the lion in. I'm telling you, I think the lion enjoyed my sermons. Matter of fact, we had that lion saved and baptized. No, we didn't really. I don't. We brought this live lion in and we preached that day about it doesn't matter if you're the king of the jungle if you live in a cage. Now this lion was a famous lion. This lion had been in a bunch of movies. I mean, this was like a famous lion. And you know, so the guy brought it. And this lion thought I was trying to play because I walk around when I preach. So this lion started pacing back and forth in the cage. The people on the front seat got really nervous. The handler had to come over. But I remember talking to the keeper of that lion that day. I said, do you think this lion may roar? Uh, about the fifth service that day on Easter, that lion didn't hear one. He just laid over and looked at me by the end of the day. He said, I've already heard this. 
But I said, you think the lion will roar? He said, oh, he may whimper a little bit and people will hear it. I said, but you think he'll roar? He said, no. He said, if he roars, it'll clear the building out. He said, you know, the lion is the king of the jungle not because he's the strongest animal, not because he's the fastest animal, not because he's the swiftest animal or the stealthiest animal. He's the king of the jungle because of the roar he possesses. He said, if this lion roared, you could hear it for miles away. He said, that's why he's the king of the jungle. He said, his roar can stop an elephant in its tracks. His roar will paralyze other animals. And I began to think about that scripture. There's an adversary moving around like a roaring lion. Come off the wall. Let me through the breach. Seeking whom he may devour. But the Bible says, they just ignored the adversary. Here's the truth in the revelation. If you ever realize that you've got a roar, and it's the roar of the lion of the tribe of Judah, you just simply say, I'm too busy doing a good work. I'm too busy on the wall. Me and my family are covered by the grace of God. We're covered by brand new mercy this morning. Matter of fact, I'm not who I used to be. I'm a new creation in Christ. Old things are passed away and old things have been made new. We're building a wall. We're on assignment for the king. I'm going to pray over you today. And this is what I pray. I'm going to pray the points that we declared that Nehemiah prayed for. We're going to pray for favor in your life. I'm going to pray for access to the right places. For some of you, God's going to give the right ideas and a strategy. Some of you is just going to plant you and give you access to the right people. I'm going to pray that God unleashes an authority in you. Because you can have a position but no authority. You can have an assignment but no authority. But if you ever walk into that position with authority, it changes everything. Matter of fact, the authority of the kingdom unlocks things in the heaven and releases things here on earth. And I'm going to pray for authority in your life. I'm going to pray that God gives you wisdom. For some of you, one moment of wisdom and one key of wisdom would change everything in your journey. One right decision would turn everything around. And I'm going to pray that God would grant you wisdom. And I want you to pray. I want you to know that in this declaration, listen, that you've already been stamped with victory. Because what God assigns and what God commissions he already declares the other side and the ending marked with victory. Because here's the revelation. He said, the battle's not yours. The battle is mine. He told Nehemiah, I'm going to fight for you. And here's the revelation. You and I may have, but he's never lost a battle. There's not been one battle he's lost. He's never been knocked down. He's never been knocked out. He doesn't have any marks on the losing column. He is undefeated in every battle. And when you ever get the revelation that God is fighting for me, he's pushing back the darkness. He's already established me. You just simply say, you know what? I'm too busy. I'm going to listen to the right voice. So I'm going to pray over you today. If you're ready to go to places and walk in places and uh, complete that assignment, I, I just want you just to close your eyes with me. And you allow me to bless you today. And the worshipers are getting ready to come and lead us into worship. And I want to pray as, and come into agreement today and just believe that God is going to work. Father, I just pray right now, Father, for favor. I pray, Father, that you would mark your people with a favor, Father, that only comes, Father, by kingdom assignments. I pray, Father, that it would be released in their life. What they could not earn, what they do not deserve, Father, would go before them, Father, and make crooked places straight. Father, I declare you are giving them access to the right people. You are giving them access, Father, to the right places. You are giving them access, Father, to walk, Father, where they have never walked. And Father, you're releasing a kingdom authority right now. I declare you're unlocking things in the heavens. Father, I pray, Father, let it happen on earth that has already been declared in the heavens. Father, I declare your kingdom is being released. And Father, there's authority coming forth. And Father, right now, supernatural wisdom and understanding is being released over your people, Father. And they are being marked with victory. They're going to have a shout of victory, a declaration of victory, a song of victory. And Father, I declare 
where every weapon that is formed against them has already been defeated. Every giant has to fall. And Father, I mark them, Father, with an anointing and a grace. And I pray it in the mighty name of Jesus. And what you have started, you will complete. You will complete. Come on, if you believe that, say amen and amen. Thank you so much for watching this message. We pray that it encouraged you. Our church is not built on one individual, but on the sacrifice of so many. And so you being a part of that means so much to us. Our vision here at City Life is to reach the lost, help restore what has been broken, and to release people into their God-given purpose. If you would like to partner with us today, text GIVE to 844-311-1777 or visit our website. For more great content and messages, be sure to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also download our City Life app and follow us on Facebook and Instagram while you're at it. Our services are at 9.30, 10.30, and 11.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'd love to have you be with us in person at one of our locations. And like we say here at City Life, go and be the city.